Hello, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Uh, Pastor David here. We're jumping into um, our text. We're continuing in Acts. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. And so as we concluded John's gospel, we thought, hey, let's start with the beginning of Acts until we get into Pentecost. And then a couple of the incredible stories that happen after that. And so just sort of a, a quick recap to get to where we are. So we kind of are, are aware of our context and what has happened. Clearly, we celebrated Easter. The resurrected Lord revealed himself to, to Mary and the disciples in the upper room and Thomas and then Peter on the beach. And, and now um, he's, he's promised him he's going to give him his Holy Spirit. And then in Acts, we learn that Jesus has been teaching his disciples for, for 40 days about the kingdom of God. And then last week, we saw that Jesus ascended into heaven. His glory, right? He just he goes into heaven and these two guys dressed in white tell the disciples, stop staring, you know, and, and they recall Jesus' words that they're to be witnesses, that they are to be witnesses, to go into the world, to go back to Ju Jerusalem, to wait for the Holy Spirit, and then to go to the ends of the earth to minister and to make disciples. So I, I got to warn you, our passage this week is a little bit weird. It's a little bit gory, even. Um, Deb and I were joking that, man, so much of the scriptures are kind of... Um, are they really child appropriate? Do we really want to give our kids these texts? But it's part of the scriptures. And, and the last sort of descriptor I would say for this text is in, in some ways it's filler. Um, it moves the plot along. It's, it's the time in between the glory of ascension and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so this text, this scriptural passage, it's not the most ripe with like, uh, spiritual disciplines or, or guidance for obedience or, um, or good faith practices. And in fact, um, some of the commentaries I read this week were kind of brutal with this passage. Uh, I'll read you some of their exact words. This text isn't very fruitful for preaching or teaching. Okay. Uh, another one said, this text holds a minimal homiletic value nor much expository significance. So with that being said, let's go ahead and flip open to our scriptures, God's word, and read this text that I sort of, I've described as filler, um, our text in between two profound things, um, and we'll see what we can get out of it. So if you have your Bibles, flip open to Acts chapter 1. We're going to read verses 12 all the way through verse 26. Again, this is right after Jesus has ascended into heaven, and they've been told, go back and wait in Jerusalem for the Spirit. So they returned to Jeru Jerusalem from the Mount called, called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day, day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room, a place they're very familiar with, where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture has been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. And then there's a sort of parenthetical note that the author of Luke Acts gives us. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all of his bowels gushed out. It's kind of gross. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akaldama, and it is called the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. And then another Psalm, let another take his office. So one, of the, uh, so one of the men who had accompanied us during all the time the Lord was with us and went out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. These are Peter's words. And they put forward two, Joseph called, called Barsabbas, who, uh, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. 
And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you've chosen to take the place in this ministry an apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered among the apostles, the eleven apostles. See? It's kind of a fun passage. We get everything from the disciples being devoted to prayer in the upper room, sort of the solidarity, this unity between them, to Peter standing up, right, leading. He's finally become the rock. He's been restored. He's been forgiven by Jesus. He's no longer bound by his guilt or his shame or his his constant comparing of himself to the others. He stands up in front of them to give a message to tell them, It's time to look into the Psalms. It's time to look into the scripture to see what we are supposed to do to interpret what has occurred to Judas and and what we need to do next. And then we get this gruesome description of uh, Judas and his bowel spilling out. And then finally, we get the sort of replacement of Judas in Matthias through a random chance of sort of casting lots and trusting who God would call. So when I said this was a filler passage, I was kind of telling the truth. Remember, Jesus told them, wait, go, but wait for the spirit. He ordered them, in fact, to wait out of uh, of chapter one. He ordered them to wait. And so they do. They go to the upper room and they wait. Next week, we celebrate Pentecost, the gift of the spirit upon God's people. But this week, we've got this passage that bridges the gap between ascension and and the Holy Spirit. So how does one preach from this passage? What do we do? How do we gain knowledge? How do we gain gain insight? There's um, several interesting things occurring in this passage. First, the disciples have to figure out this new world. Things have changed. Second, they need to deal with their anger. They need to deal with their pain. They need to deal with the sense of betrayal and the sense of loss from somebody who was once their dear friend, a disciple, a minister with them, Judas. And then finally, they need to get all their ducks in a row so that when the waiting is over, they're ready for the work. They're ready for the ministry. So can you recall a time where you spent hours, months, years, you name it, being trained for a purpose to do something new, something that you weren't comfortable with, something you hadn't done before? And can you recall what it felt like to be finally unleashed to do that task? I'll give you some examples. Maybe some of you went to school to become a teacher. So you learned all the best practices, pedagogy and classroom management and the best books and, and how to set up your room and for education and learning to happen. And then, you know, you did student teaching and you got a master's degree and you passed your credentialing and all those things. But at some point, there was that first day where you sat in the classroom and you were the authority. First day of school, no more student teachers and you had to do it. You had to practice it. Or maybe, um, maybe you can remember the first time you played a sport, Little League, or maybe you're the first time you were a parent with of a Little Leaguer, and right, you were playing catch in the backyard. You took the kid to the batting cages. Then they got onto a team. They start to practice for a couple of months, and they're getting through the rhythm of the game. But there's that first game, that first at-bat where somebody's throwing at you, right? Or you're watching somebody throw at your kid. Or the first time you go for that pop-up in a game where it counts or a ground ball, You've been training, but now you've got to do it. Or maybe you've decided, finally, I'm going to install my first dishwasher at my house. And so after watching all the appropriate YouTube videos to learn how, after consulting all the competent adults in your life, you go for it. There's water everywhere. And finally you say, I'm calling a plumber because I can't do this. It's too hard, right? Or I'm going to electrocute myself to death if I try to do this thing. Well, I want to share a time, a first for me. One of my first jobs out of college was actually um, to be a claims adjuster, which means I worked for an auto insurance company. And um, and when people got in car accidents, they would call and I'd have to remedy the situation. And so the training was extensive. In fact, they flew us to Columbus, Ohio for two weeks to go through modules, to see corporate headquarters, to understand the, the company's policy and culture. And then we spent months 
reading police reports, reading the law, reading policies and guidelines around insurance and making sure we understood declaration pages and coverages and and all this stuff. And then then we had to learn computer systems and how to record the conversations and what language we could use and couldn't use and not to make any promises that we couldn't fulfill. All this training. And then finally they said, hey, here's your cubicle, sit in this desk, turn your phone on, you're gonna start getting calls. And so we sat there. And I remember we, there were like eight of us hired at the same time and we all started the first day at the same time after all this training and we're nervous and we're excited. And that first call I get it and go, hello, um, thank you for calling such and such insurance company. My name is David. I'm your claims adjuster. Uh, you know, how are you doing today? How are you? And he goes, how do you think I'm doing? I just got into a car accident. And I go, oh yeah, this is a tense job. Great. And so I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And he goes, and I'm late for my job interview. So I'm not even going to get this job anymore. And now I'm completely flustered right? Like, oh my gosh, that's not the script I was given. How do I respond to the situation? So like a uh, nincompoop, I go, I'm so sorry to hear that, Mr. So-and-so. Um, we'll take care of this for you. You're, you know, we, we'll take care of this. We'll remedy the situation. And he goes, oh yeah, you're going to get me a job, right? All this training, months of training, all this investment in us as claims adjusters. And first day on the job, I kind of go, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm equipped for this. I don't know if I'm prepared for this. And I think the disciples are in a similar situation. They're in a similar spot. Jesus has trained them. He spent years with them, walking with them, working with them, performing miracles, showing them what to do, inviting them into the ministry. And now he's gone, gone. But he's told them, go and be my witnesses. You can almost hear them saying, we've never done this work without you before. So what do they do? They go to the upper room and they devote themselves to prayer. They, 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 yeah, and you know what? That's great advice. If you don't know what to do, devoting yourself to prayer is fantastic. What a great, what a great um, foundation. What a great uh, benchmark to say, okay, if I don't know what to do, let me offer this up to God. Let me devote myself to prayer. And if not, if if Jesus' departure wasn't big enough, if that wasn't big enough to deal with on their own, to work through, they also have Judas' betrayal, Judas' loss, the loss of a friend, of a colleague, of somebody they trusted, and, and this pain that's left over, this betrayal that's left over. And so what does Peter do? He stands up like the leader, trying to make sense of it all. He accesses his resources. He accesses his experience. He accesses the scriptures, God's word. And they try to discern, what do we do? And so they, they go to the Psalms to make sense of their present reality. In this, in this chapter, two different Psalms are, are quoted, Psalm 109 and Psalm 69. And, and they try to say, okay, if God's guidance is found here, let's see what God wants us to do. And so the Psalms address these two things for them, making sense of Judas's death and making sense of replacing him. But I, I gotta tell you, the Psalms they pick are wild. I just wanna read small sections of them to you. Uh, for example, Psalm 109 says this, Be not silent, O God of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are open against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and they attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good. And they hated, and I'm hated for my love. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. And this is anger. This is like crazy anger. And then here's the line they actually quote. May another take his office. That's what it says. May another take his office. And then it gets really nasty. This is in our Bible. This is like a legitimate prayer of, of David or the psalmist. It says this, May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Sheesh. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditors seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. I'll read a little bit more. This is dark stuff, right? May his prosperity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before the Lord and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Let them be before the Lord continually. 
that he may be cut off. Sorry, that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth. Like literally, the psalmist is saying, I hope God erases this guy from the earth. Might his children be fatherless? I mean, it's just, it's dark, right? And the reason I read that to you is that it's clear that the disciples are in pain and in distress. If they're looking to figure out what to do with this Judas guy, and they're going to this sort of lament, this cry out where you're asking for God to absolutely punish your enemies, to destroy their reputation, that their children would wander hunger with hunger in their bellies. I mean, there's some anger. There's turmoil. There's tension. And so then they also go to Psalm 69. And again, I'll just read a, a portion of it. And so from that first Psalm, they discern, oh, it's okay. We can replace Judas. Let another take his office. Good. Uh, in this dark, angry lament, we found a, a little sentence that says you can replace him. Okay, great. So Peter says we can replace him. And then out of Psalm 69, I'll start in verse 16, but the whole thing is dark and messed up. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast, steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste. Answer me. Draw near to my soul, redeem me, ransom me from my enemies. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all around me. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity and there was none and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food and my thirst. They gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table before them become a snare. And when they are at peace, let it become a trap. You see this again, this anger this calling out and this anger. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Make their loins tremble continually. That's interesting. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp, this is the, and then this is the quote that Peter uses. May their camp be desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. And that's what Peter sort of says, or or actually not Peter, the, um, the inserted author of Acts sort of says, you know, it said this in Psalms, Judas dies this way, his bowels explode, and now his field is a field of blood. And so they go searching for the scriptures, right? For they persecute him when you have struck down, they do, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Again, the disciples are angry. The disciples are hurt. The disciples are stuck. They're in a new place. They interpret these words out of these two Psalms and they adopt them for their own pain, for their loss, and for their anger. Now, I'm not a big fan of this kind of um, request from God to speak to us, where we kind of go, all right, God, I'm going through this really tough thing. Uh, I need you to speak to me. I'm going to randomly open the text and point to it, and I need you to speak to me. Give me a word. And I'm not saying the disciples did this. They are smart enough, and they are entrenched enough in the scriptures that I think they knew those psalms that when I'm feeling uh, attacked, when I'm feeling scared, when I'm feeling pain, I can go to this place and find some comfort. And then they go, ah, this kind of makes sense for our situation. Of course, Judas's field would be called a field of blood because we got this line here. And of, of, of course we can appoint a new apostle because it says you can, you can replace his office. But we kind of, sometimes we use the scriptures like that where we go, all right, God speaks to me and randomly we point to it. And so maybe um, I'll give you some examples of how this can kind of be a little dangerous. And I mean this in a funny way, um, but this sort of point and click or pray and click or, 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 or all right, God, find me a way can be a little problematic. Let's say you're having marital problems. So you go to the scriptures and just kind of open it up randomly and it opens up to Proverbs 21, 19, which says this, it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Okay, so time to get your tent and hit the road, right? I mean, you could read that and go, okay, so do I resolve our differences? Do we work this out or go, well, one of us is angry, so I'm out of here. I'm gonna go live in the wilderness, see ya, right? Okay, or I'll give, you, I'll give you another example. Let's say at work, you've got, you're interviewing several candidates, you've got two great candidates, maybe you've got four of them, and you're like, all right, God, I don't know who to pick. 
I don't know who should be on my team. I need your help. And so you, you take your Bible, you open it up and you point to it and you, you end up on Judges and a passage about Gideon. And it says this, the Lord told him, separate those who lap the water up with their tongues as dogs lap from those who kneel down and drink it. And so you, hey, guys, I know this is going to sound a little bit weird. Ladies, I'm going to need you to drink from this trough. It's going to help me decide who to hire for this position, right? It's not quite it's funny that that's not, this is not, not discernment. I'll give you one more example. Maybe you're having problems disciplining your kids. You just don't know how to, to help them be kind and respectful, or maybe you've, you've caught them in a kind of a, a tough situation and you're trying to figure out what do I do here? I don't want to shame my kids. I don't want to spank my kids. I don't want to hurt my kids, but I want my kids to, to grow up responsible. I want them to be able to learn from their mistakes, to, to learn the right way to move about this world, to navigate this tough thing that is life. And so you pull out your Bible and you randomly point, and it just so happens to land on 2 Samuel 10, 4. So Hanan seized David's envoys and shaved off half of each of the men's beards and cut off their garments at the buttocks, and he sent them on their way. Could you just imagine a parent going, look, uh, sorry, sorry, my friends. Sorry, buddy. Uh, this is kind of what God told me to do. I got to shave off half your beard or half your head, and I, I need to cut out. I need to cut out the buttocks of your pants, and you need to go back to school. I mean, could you imagine using this sort of? All right, God. In some way, it, 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 I know Peter didn't do this. They didn't. But in some way, they've taken these sort of dark psalms and they found it to be applicable and maybe in a more human way applicable to their human feelings right of pain loss betrayal and how to move on in this new world that they've been called to minister in we you can see them in their mind saying we we don't have jesus anymore we don't have judas anymore we don't have the holy spirit yet so what do we do Let's replace the one we can. Let's replace Judas. The scriptures tell us that we can have another take his office. And so I want us to spend a moment talking about Judas. He was a real friend. He was a disciple. He spent years with Jesus. In fact, he loved Jesus. And Jesus loved him. And yes, Judas betrayed Jesus. Are we supposed to pray prayers about our enemies like the ones modeled in Psalm 109 and Psalm 69? I'm not convinced that we are. If Jesus is God's clearest revelation to the world, he flips the script. He tells us to pray for our enemies, to love our enemies, to walk the extra mile, to take the tunic off our back, to bless those who persecute us to turn the other cheek. And then is Judas lost for forever? Did he commit the ultimate sin, the gravest act? Did his betrayal eliminate him from belonging to God's family? There are many in this world who buy into the doctrine of once saved, always saved. And if you do, You either have to say Judas was lying the whole time and Jesus allowed it. Or you have to say, you know what? You might have messed up. Messed up big time, even. But maybe he's not lost. Was this simply a lapse in judgment? Was he trying to force Jesus' hand to, to, to be the Messiah, to overthrow Rome? Or was this total rejection? Was it, or was it greed? Did he just want the coin? Did he just want to be able to buy that field? And this was his way to do that. We don't, we don't know. But here's what I hope. I hope to see Judas in heaven. I think as Christians, we have to. We have to want redemption for everyone, even the people that turn Jesus over to be killed. I have to hold on to that hope. It would be wrong as a Christian to hope that Jesus isn't with us in heaven. It would be wrong to hope that God's grace doesn't get extended to Judas. 
They shared so much life together, so much joy together, miracles, ministry, you name it. This is a tragic story. This is not something to celebrate. I, I'm not, I don't go, yeah, Judas got what he deserved. His bowels exploded all over a field. No, it's tragic. It's another loss. Speaking of Judas, there is a slight issue in that our Bible isn't very consistent about Judas's death. In Matthew's gospel, Judas is killed uh, by suicide. And here, he explodes on either by swelling or falling head first. In the early church, there's even a third kind of lore around Jesus's death, and it's that Jesus... Um, uh, not Jesus, Judas, rather, Judas got so big and so swollen and kind of just um, so gorged that one day as a chariot was coming by through a small passage, he couldn't, the chariot and he couldn't fit, and he basically got squished to death by this chariot and, and all over the walls in this passage. Again, gory, gruesome stuff. So what do we do with these seemingly contradictory narratives about Judas's death? N.T. Wright helps us here. He says this, Look, since nobody in the early church attempted to tidy things up, we probably shouldn't either. One way or another, whether it was by actual suicide, as Matthew says, or whether it was a sudden and violent onset of a fatal disease, like Luke suggests, Judas was no longer among them. And that's where we find this time. The disciples are trying to figure out what do we do with this empty disciple or apostle place. They're trying to restore the 12 that resembles the 12 tribes, and they only have 11. And so this brings me to sort of um, the last theme that has emerged for me from this sort of in-between passage, this uh, filler passage. And it goes like this. There's a huge difference between what we think ministry is like and what ministry actually entails. Nobody goes into ministry. Nobody feels called by God. Nobody has their heart set on witnessing to, the, to, to Jesus's kingdom, to proclaiming the gospel that is also knowingly and excited about the administrative duties associated with it. The maintenance parts, the organizational change, the, the practical stuff, the nitty gritty. And that's where the disciples are. They're caught in between the ascension of glory and the gift of the spirit. And, and what happens in these in-between moments, these incredible moments, that's where they are. The sort of the administration stuff, the, the business, the organization, the doldrums, the necessity of administration, of structures, of policy, of preparedness. And that's life for us. Life is a strange mixture of of rapture and routine. And I don't mean rapture, rapture of being called up into the sky. That, again, that's a very new theology and not actually in the Bible. When I say rapture, I mean this, this feeling of intense pleasure and joy, the sort of the high peaks of life, right? The, the moments where you go, I'm called to ministry. I'm called to, to preach God's word, to teach God's word, and what you've been called to, to be, to be neighborly in these incredible stories, right? And then routine, the ordinary, the regular, Scheduling, daily life, maintenance. You cannot have one without the other. Religion can never be all light and laughter. There's also labor, the hard work. It's the same for the church. And the reality is that organization, policy, and procedure, and, and all that stuff can, can be a straitjacket in which the spirit of Christ gets paralyzed. But the spirit without any framework to operate within whatsoever can be sort of like a, a wind with no sails to catch it. We have these systems. We have our ways. Um, so that when, we, when God calls us, we're ready. And at the same time, if, um, if we're so overly organized and constantly preparing, we stifle the spirit as well. And so there's this balance between ministry and organization that happens. And here we see it. They've got to elect this, this new apostle. And so they take time to do it. They discern how to do it. They come up with a process to do it. Think about all the organization that is required to get church going. We've got to pay bills. We have to, 
an army of volunteers. We've got session meetings and discernment, and we've got property management. We've got elders and deacons that you guys elect to, to get into leadership. By the way, if we casted lots, it feels like it'd be a way faster process than doing it by committee and congregational meetings and all this stuff in training. I kind of want to go back to this Acts model where we go, who's been here a long time or not, actually, and uh, let's cast lots and see who God picks, right? No, we, we can't go to that model. But this, it takes a lot of people. I mean, I, I, I'm always scared on any sort of volunteer appreciation day to name everybody because we're going to miss so many names. But I think about how many people it took to get live streaming going at this church, how many people it took to organize our ushers, to organize off-campus communion, to organize uh, a worship on a Sunday morning, all these things, the organization, the structure, it allows for incredible ministry to take place. Mops, buddy break, prison ministry for so many years, Camp Joy, music ministry, adult ministry, youth ministry, children's ministry, various support groups, Bible studies, you name it, all these things, prayer groups, all of it. It takes some organization, it takes some discernment, it takes protocol. We find ourselves in a similar, similar place, I think, as the disciples did in this early story in Acts. They're in between Ascension and Pentecost. It's a new world, and we're in the same way. We've got a kind of a new ministry context. The landscape has changed. Society has changed. We're in a liminal space, a place in between. Yeah, we're open, but, but not like before. And we're still called to be Christ's witnesses. We're still called to love, um, to minister to our community. And yet we're, we're still trying to figure out how do we mobilize our people to do that? Corporately, at least. How do we accomplish the ministry that Jesus has called us into? And one of the ways that our situation is different than the disciples that we are on the other side of, of Pentecost. We have a spirit we have the benefit of being able to discern, to listen, to seek the Spirit within us, within our community, um, and to go where Jesus has called us. So here's how I'd like us to close our time. Let us do what the disciples did and devote ourselves to prayer. Might we be praying for our leaders of this church, pray for our elders, pray for the staff, pray for discernment, pray for wisdom, Pray that we would use the scripture, our experiences, our circumstances, and lead this congregation, both in ministry and in administration, because they go hand in hand. God has wonderful things in store for this church. He always does. For his people, there's ministry to be done. There is ministry to be done. Let's do it together as we anticipate celebrating Pentecost next week. Amen.